prayer meets on Tuesdays at noon. If you would like to be a part of our prayer time together as a church, please come Tuesdays at noon. Also, we're having a meeting this afternoon, right after, or I say afternoon, it's mid-morning, right after this service for the audio-video ministry. If you have any desires or thoughts about serving in that ministry, we would love for you to be a part of that meeting. Brother Chris will be leading that, uh, and it's at 10 a.m. right here in the youth room. Also, Men's Brotherhood Breakfast will be Sunday, September 20th at 6.45 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall downstairs. Also, Wednesdays. Wednesday's activities have returned to normal, and remember that we do do a noon Bible study. Uh, I started that noon Bible study uh, for a reason. I wanted uh, to not want to hear an excuse of, I can't drive at night. Um, I also wanted people who work second shift, third shift, or who serve in the church on Wednesday nights to be a part of the Bible study as well. And so I wanted everybody to have a chance to be a part of the Bible studies because to be honest with you, come Wednesday, man, I need a little bit of Jesus. Uh, I need some fellowship time. And so Wednesdays are a good time to come and to get re-energized, to finish out the week strong. And so please remember those Wednesday activities as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to come and to just be a part of worship this morning, to be a part of a body of believers. I just ask that you anoint our voices as we sing praises unto you, that you open our ears and our eyes, Father, to hear your blessed truth from your word and to see Jesus this morning, Father. To see him in the word, to see him in the praises, to see him as the body gathers together, for he truly is the head of the church. And I just ask that you be with us, forgive us where we have fallen short, and strengthen us, Father, to be the very light and salt you commanded us to be in this dark and dying world. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. One, two, three. Let's stand here in the church. Sing all hell's power in Jesus' name. Let me 
over some newfound truth through your scriptures, Lord, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching, Lord, maybe the singing that is done today, Lord. We would be revitalized. And that your name would be praised and glorified again today by our lips, by our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.
It is a pleasure to be here with you. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark here on Sunday mornings, and we are continuing our way through this wonderful Gospel book. Um, the message series has been titled Amazed, because that's exactly what we desire, to be amazed at what Christ has said and what He has done, and to have it refreshed in our minds. To not allow this world to get so busy in our minds that we forget what Christ has accomplished for us just as we have sung so beautifully this morning. Again, thank you, worship team, for those songs. It was a blessing. The last time that we were together, I preached a message simply titled, When It's Hard to Believe. If you missed that message, you can go online and watch it online because it deals with the same issues that most of us have to deal with at times in our lives. In fact, as we discussed clearly in that message last week, I've never met anybody that didn't deal with doubt. And if you've ever struggled with doubt, you need to watch the message. Because in our passage last week, you see a father who dealt with doubt, extreme doubt. In fact, I mentioned that there was two lines that were probably some of the most heartbreaking lines you'll ever find in Scripture where he said to Jesus, if you can do anything. Then he also said, I do believe, help my unbelief. You see a man that was struggling. And so doubt is something that all of us fight and wrestle with. And we talked about the difference between doubt and just simple unbelief. And it's somewhere there in between. And so I wanted to address the issues because in that passage you see reasons for doubt. And we talked about some of the reasons that people struggle with doubts today as you find right there in the Scripture that are just as relevant today. The first issue that we addressed about why people struggle with doubt is simply because of the failure of the church. It is the failure of the church that leads many people to doubt. And when I say failure of the church, I don't mean that the structural building is beginning to crumble. I'm talking about us. It's our failures. It's our shortcomings that cause many people to stumble. If you don't believe me, you let a pastor fall. You let a deacon fall. You let a godly man or a woman that served in church for many years stumble and sin, just like everybody else does, but you let them stumble and see what happens. It's the failure of the church. In that passage, we saw countless, or in multiple reasons, but one of them was right there in the beginning. And what you see is the disciples bickering and arguing with scribes while everybody's focused on them, large crowd, what you don't see is the broken father and the hurting son. They're not seen in the passage in the beginning, just a bickering religious community. And sadly, that's what a lot of the world sees when it looks at the church. A bickering religious community. And what we are supposed to be doing is serving and loving and helping other people. What the world craves is to see somebody that can actually help them in their struggles. And I talked about the fact that if it wasn't for the fact that I finally found a church that would just simply let a drunk sit in the back pew and not judge him and not cast him out, not mock him or talk behind his back constantly. And if they did, they never did it to my face to where I realized it. But they simply loved on me. And the love that they showed me and the grace that they showed me and taught me about the love and grace of Christ changed my life. And that's what the world needs to see. Not us arguing over the color of carpet or the walls or chairs or pews or songs or clothing or whatever it is. Because 90% of the stuff we argue and we see churches or people leave churches over is over personal preferences. And personal preferences are not a command in Scripture. Jesus never once said, you shall go to the church that does everything the way you want it done. What He did say is, you shall be one, as I and the Father are one. And through your unity, the world will know that the Father sent me. 
If we can overcome and actually do that first step of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, which is deny thyself, take up your cross and follow me, then you will realize and watch the world begin to thrive and grow toward this church. Because in this church they'll see something they ain't found out there. That was just one. The other one is suffering that never seems to end or makes sense. The boy that he had was hurt. He was struggling. He had an evil spirit that was in him that was constantly trying to kill him. And you see the father pleading Jesus and the disciples saying, have mercy on us. Help us. And he uses the plural us because it wasn't just a boy that was struggling and hurting. Yes, he was struggling and hurting and that evil spirit was trying to kill him. But the father was just as burdened and broken over his son. And you see Christ say this beautiful phrase to him. If I can. All things are possible to him who believes. And we need to see that there is suffering in this world. Me and my wife were having a conversation just this past week. She was broken and burdened over loved ones in my family who struggle with the issue of evil in this world. Why do bad things happen to good people? Y'all ever hear that phrase? Man, I hear it every day. And do you know how I respond? A lot of bad things happen to bad people. I mean, we just naturally assume that we're good and we expect good things in return. But the reality is, Scripture teaches all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Scripture teaches it reigns on the just and the unjust alike. Suffering is a part of this world because it's a fallen world. But what separates a Christian from those of the world is that we don't allow the suffering to control us. My Savior said, in this world you will have many trials and tribulations, but you take hope, you take courage, you be strengthened in the fact that I have overcome this world. Death has no victory. Death has no sting. I'm worried about that anymore. I know where I'm going. So I'm doing exactly what I read multiple saints do in the Old Testament. I'm just a traveler driving through this world. If COVID takes me out, if it's a car wreck, if it's cancer, or if it's just an aneurysm that nobody even knows about that drops me on a football field, so be it. My life is secure in my Father's hands. Amen. I'm not going to spend my time here on this earth worried to death about death. I'm going to spend my time here on earth worried about life. Living my life for the glory of my Father. We also see the lack of intimacy with Christ as another reason for doubt. The disciples can't understand how at one point in the Gospels they're able to cast demons out, but yet in this child they can't cast the demon out. And so, not wanting to be embarrassed by questioning Christ in front of this large crowd, they wait till they get alone and they ask Jesus, Jesus, why could we not get that demon out? Why did we fail? And Jesus simply told them that demon only comes out through prayer and fasting. You're not going to overcome the evil in this world or the evil in your life or the suffering in this world or the suffering in your life if you're not having any time with Christ. This world will overcome you. Believe it or not, I tell you, I, I've had this conversation with people before. I, I, I hear people say all the time, boy, that was all over me today. And I tell them, sweetheart, or bro, if the devil was on you, you wouldn't be standing. He's too strong. Just because bad things are going on don't mean the devil's on you. That old boy is stout. And he's been knocking people down since the Garden of Eden. It's our intimacy with Christ that will help us overcome the world. It's our closeness with Him that will help us make rhyme and reason and be able to sing praises as Paul and Silas did in the midst of a prison. 
To have joy that is not of this world, love that is not of this world, a unity that is not of this world. To be in this world but not of this world is what Scripture tells us. i got to stop because I'm going to preach it again. It's fast. <laughs> Our passage this morning follows right on the heels of this. Uh, amazingly enough, the disciples are walking with Christ. And again, I told you a couple weeks ago, we've already hit the hinge in the Gospel of Mark, meaning the door has now swung open. His focus is going to be on suffering, death, and resurrection. He is going to hit it time and time again, all throughout the rest of the Gospel of Mark. But the disciples ain't catching the hint. And here in our passage, we see it again. Christ is addressing the issue that is about to be dominant in their world and even in our world today. And all they want to do is debate who the best. Who number one. And so because I want it to be so culturally relevant, I, I did it in Spanish and I titled the message this morning, Numero Uno. How about that? And so... Numero uno is the message this morning. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 30, going through verse 37. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37 this morning. Well, I ask that you have the ability to stand out of reverence for the reading of Christ's holy and perfect word in expectation of what he can and will do through the hearing and the reading of his word, knowing it never returns void. And that faith comes by hearing, the hearing of the word of Christ. Starting in verse 30 of chapter 9. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement. And they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all, and a servant of all. And taking a child, he sat him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to just be able to come and to, oh, to be able to sing praises unto you, to be able to pause in this world that is spinning into madness every day. Father, it doesn't make sense to me. And I find myself getting so frustrated and struggling with the things that are going on. But here I can pause. Here I can find truth. Here I can find some rest. Here I can focus on Christ. Focus on the call He's placed upon my life. And have that peace that is beyond any understanding of this world. Help me, Father, to find the joy that is in Christ and Christ alone. I ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. There is no doubt to this. We know it's true. This sentiment of wanting to know who the greatest is is still a driving and dominant force in our life today. It is. It is all over our culture. In fact, let's go to one of the biggest issues that has always been when it comes to the sporting world. Let's go to college football. 
When it comes to college football, who's the best? Auburn. Oh, uh, see, I didn't ask for participation. <laughs> The question is, did, did, did you hear it? What a great example. I didn't hear one team announced. I heard multiple teams announced. Just two. But we're in Alabama. <laughs> only two. One of the things to do to help us figure out what is the greatest is they implemented a college football playoff system. Because for years, if you could get the local barbershop newspaper to say you are a national champion, guess what? You're a national champion. It don't matter if you got the best record or who you beat or what. Somebody said you're a champion. By George, throw it out there. And so we implemented a college football playoff system. Of course, they only put four teams in it. And so now we're trying to figure out who the best four teams because we can't even figure that out. And even in the midst of starting this playoff system, y'all do realize there's a lot of controversy over who's the greatest, even after it. I'll give you an example. I just moved here from Florida. Do you know there is a team in Florida that claims a national title called the University of Central Florida, the Golden Knights? They claimed one at the same time that Alabama claimed the one. Same time. And you can't really take it away from them because the newspaper said they were. Isn't that how that works? Of course, the truth is, had Auburn actually beat UCF, that wouldn't even have been an issue. But because Auburn beat Bama that year, and Bama didn't go to the SEC championship, and UCF did beat Auburn, they just make the claim. Even with this playoff system, we still struggle to figure out who is the greatest. I wish I could just look at you and say that that issue is only in the sporting world. But it's not. Who is the greatest is an issue in every aspect of our life. We want to know who is the greatest when it comes to our jobs. We want to know who truly deserves the next raise, who deserves the next promotion, who deserves to be the supervisor or the CEO. We deserve to know that. We want to know that. And we want to know where our place is when it comes to the workplace environment. Not just sports. We want to know who the best doctor is. We want to know who the best stock market is or advisor for that. We want to know who the best dentist is, the plumber is, who the best transmission repair guy is. That's a personal issue. I'll talk about that later. We, we want to know all kinds of stuff. We really do. We want to know who the best is. And the truth is, we want to know it in church, too. We want to know who the best preacher is. We want to know who the best children minister is. And we, we only want the best. And we're seeking out the best. And we're wanting to know who the greatest. I, I, I found a, a quote from Muhammad Ali because you cannot talk about the greatest and not talk about the greatest, right? I love Muhammad Ali. I really do. I wish I had his attitude just a little bit. Just give me a portion of his attitude. But I like what he said. I am the greatest. I said that even before I knew I was. <laughs> That's awesome. Everybody's got a little Muhammad Ali in them. We really do. We may not realize it, but we all do because we want our just due. We want our recognition. We have that desire to be the greatest. And what this passage does this morning is it actually tells us how do you become the greatest? 
for a little context to get us started. We need to see that Jesus and his disciples are working their way back to Capernaum this morning. He is going back to their home village. And when I say home, I don't mean Nazareth for Jesus, but really where Peter, James, and John, where most of the disciples lived, and Jesus never really returned back to Nazareth. Every time he went back to Nazareth, they would end up wanting to kill him. So he didn't go there very often. But what he did is he stayed at Peter's house a lot. And this is where Peter lived. So they're heading home. We see this there in verses 30 and 31 of our passage. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Again, we, we already addressed the fact that the, the hinge has already happened. Jesus now has one really big focus on his mind. And that is, I'm about to die. And I'm about to rise again. And he is teaching this over and over again. And it is no doubt a broken record for these disciples. As you've already seen in one chapter, we've seen him mention it three times. And so he is constantly hitting this issue with them because he needs them to understand this. Because the man that they have left everything to follow for years is about to be no more. And they need to be encouraged. The problem is, is even though he, he takes them and he's trying to avoid the crowd so he can teach and drive this in, they ain't got a clue. They are not receiving this well at all. We see this in verse 32. But they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask Him. You know, the truth is, that's why I love the disciples because, man, I see myself in them. I've sat there in school many times and I've had a teacher go over something that they have gone over multiple times and I refused to raise my hand and ask a question because I didn't want to look like a moron. No one had already talked about it. But us disciples of Christ, we're the same way. How many of you have heard that if you want to be first, you need to be last? And the truth is, how many times do we question that? How many times do we question the fact that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him? How many times do we question it whether we should turn the other cheek or love our enemy? always got these questions and we don't always grasp it but the disciples didn't want to ask because they didn't want to be embarrassed they didn't want jesus to be like <laughs> like we saw in that last passage where he goes how long am i going to be with you we see here that the disciples were questioning it but what amazes me is that during this moment where Christ is teaching about how He's about to be arrested, how He's about to suffer, how He's about to die, what are the disciples talking about? Are they asking each other, what does He mean, die? What does He mean He's about to be arrested? No, that ain't what they're talking about. What we see here is that they're actually arguing about who is going to be the greatest. Who truly is going to be the greatest in this kingdom? And I can picture this in my head, y'all. One of the things I like to do when I read Scripture is I try to put it in my head what it probably looked like. And I can see Jesus walking with His disciples. And I can see all the disciples talking amongst themselves. And I can see Peter. You know, Peter, Peter is a little bit bold. He likes to talk. And he's probably saying, hey, y'all were there when I said he's the Christ. And he's like, you're the rock, man. I'm going to build a church off that statement right there. And you know, God gave that to you. Peter's probably walking around with his chest all puffed up. And then you know James and John, they're known as the sons of thunder. No doubt one of them said, yeah, Peter, then you got called Satan. Back up, bro. You ain't that bad. And so they're debating. And then I really feel sorry for the other disciples because Peter, James, and John are like, man, we went up on the mountain and saw Jesus glorified. And so when Jesus said, some of y'all are going to see the kingdom and power and glory, we saw it. Why, well, y'all were down there fussing and fighting with scribes. 
can't even take care of all the dead man. Man, I can see them fussing and fighting. I can see them talking about it. Why? Because that's no different than half our water cooler conversations. They're talking about who's the best. And no doubt Judas at some point in time probably said, man, Jesus trusts me with the money. I'm the most trustworthy of all of you. Boy, I wish that was true. <laughs> Truth is, I can picture this easy with them constantly fussing and fighting over who is the best or the best or the greatest. And so when they finally make it back to Peter's home there in Capernaum, we read in verses 33 and 34 this. They came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. And so in the midst of Jesus talking about his suffering and death, we see disciples fussing, fighting, and bickering or arguing or debating who of them was the best. Who is the greatest disciple? Y'all, this is something that is in all of us. This is something that we all struggle with and we all have to work at because many of you may have been just like me. When I was growing up, I was grow, grown up, I was groomed into wanting to be the best. You don't settle for second place. I knew from the moment that I was able to remember that second place is the first what? Loser. There you go. You don't strive for second. It's best or nothing. It is 100% at every single thing you do. And we strive that we put, pour that into our children because we expect the same out of them. You must be the greatest. You need to be the best. We do not want a silver medal. We want the gold. That is what we expect. The best. The truth is, is that a lot of us have forgotten why we even play sports to begin with. Y'all do realize that the whole point of sports is truly to build the character of the players. That's the point. One of the reasons, and that's why I wore this shirt this morning, because I want y'all to see I am not against sports at all. In fact, you will see me on a ball field every day of the week this time of the year. I'm always there. I love sports, but I also strive to remind myself there is a reason why I do what I do. The reason I do is because I want to pour into those kids. I want to teach them what good ethics is. I want to teach them what good sportsmanship is. I also want to teach them that they need to learn in their life that you've got to give some things 100% knowing that you're never going to get it all back. That it is okay to lose in life. That it's just a fact of life. Is there anybody in this room that had never lost at something? You've got to learn to lose and lose well. And one of the reasons I like coaching football is because of this little fact right here. 99% of all football players will never play one single play after the age of 40. Will never do it again. In fact, I would say that 80%, if not more, will never play one single play after high school. You'll never play again. And you're going to have to learn to give everything you've got, blood, sweat, and tears, while you're young, because there's going to be a day you're never going to play this sport again. And truth is, most sports are that way. Unless you're playing tennis or golf, most sports you're not going to play when you're after the age of 50. Because you just ain't got the abilities to play it. We need to teach them what it truly means to be great. To not quit when things get tough. But sadly, when it comes to a lot of us, we fail at this. And you see it all the time when you look at news, when you see parents that are yelling, cussing, and fighting in the stands. And you see it in Little League as if one of them were going to get a scholarship that day. No, it's that Muhammad Ali in us. And it's us also trying to live vicariously through 
our kids' lives. We need to remember what Christ talks about being the greatest. And when it comes to this issue, I want to see one of the first issues. I'm going to address a couple problems before we get into the truth behind it. One of the problems that we all struggle with and we all know it's there is that issue of pride. Pride can be a good thing, but I tell you it is also the root of all evil. It is the core sin. I remind people when I'm addressing them and that issue comes up that in the middle of pride and in the middle of sin has one common thing. I. Because it's all about you. It is your focus and your drive and it is you that are being driven. It's you wanting all the recognition for what it is that you have done. I'm reminded of a little story and it's a silly story but I, it always comes up every time I think about the issue of pride. There was a couple birds getting ready to fly south for the winter and a frog did not want to stay up there for the winter. It is not going to be a good winter for this frog. And so the frog decided he wanted to go down south too and he asked the birds, can I just simply be on your, ride your back as you go south for the winter? And they said, there's no way that we can carry you on our back. And then the frog thought for a minute and he's like, look, if you put a stick between your two beaks, between two birds, I'll bite that stick and y'all can carry me that way. That way I'm not affecting your flying. The birds are like, all right, no problem. And so sure enough, that's what they do. Is they, two birds pick up a stick, a frog bites a stick, and they head off south. And a man just happened to be looking up, and he saw that, and he said, man, that is awesome. Who in the world thought of doing that? And the frog said, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Silly, ain't it? <laughs> God bless me. I think of it every time I think of pride. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. Every one of us, we crave that recognition. Every one of us does. And we want it with everything we got to the point that we're willing to do things that should not be done. Having that attention constantly drawn to us. And we forget the lesson that Christ told us in Matthew 6, 3, where it says, But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He also told them that when you pray, pray in your closet. Don't pray right there in front of the streets and fast in front of everybody. And make sure you look really bad when you're fasting so everybody can do what? Praise you. Because that's what we all see. Again, what was it that caused even one of the most beautiful angels to fall? Seeking pride. Seeking to be worshipped. Seeking for people to draw attention to them. And every one of us struggles with that little Muhammad Ali and wants to be the greatest. Another issue that we see is that of selfishness. When it comes to wanting to be the greatest, selfishness is there. Remember that these disciples are thinking that they're about to be ruling and reigning with Jesus physically. They're going to be in a throne room. They're going to have power and authority. And they are fighting over who's going to get the bigger slice of the pie. And that's what they're arguing over. Jesus is saying, I'm about to suffer. I'm about to die. They're saying, I want my share. My fair share. You give me what I deserve. And they want to know who is the best and the greatest. The truth is we all have that phrase and you hear me use it all the time, that slogan from Burger King. I want it my way right away at Burger King now. And that's how we live our lives. I want it my way right away in my life now. Why? Because it's all about me. And every one of us battles with that issue. And we don't realize all the struggles that come along with it. We Selfishness is something that is just naturally there. I'll never forget. I've got Maggie in my nose, but the truth is, Sam did it too. Most kids do. Man, when they were babies, both of them. <clears throat> Not so much Sam. Sam was a thumb sucker. I love that very shit this morning. <laughs> but Maggie was a pacifier baby. She had her patty. And she would be sitting there in a room, and I know this is like so crazy now being that COVID is everything, but sitting in a room there in the daycare, I saw her when I went to go pick her up one time, take her pappy out of her mouth, 
put it on the ground and take the pappy out of the other baby's mouth and put it right in hers. <laughs> you ever seen a baby do that? Yeah, you have. Because selfishness is just a part of life. You have to teach children to be selfless. You have to teach them to put others before themselves. They come into the world doing what? Screaming. <laughs> and they scream when they poop. They scream when they pee. They scream when they're hungry. And they scream when they just want to be cuddled. They scream all the time. Do you think at any point did my children ever thought, man, my dad worked hard today. Maybe he needs a little bit of extra rest. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if they think that today. <laughs> you have to teach people to be selfless, to put others before themselves. It's not something that is normal. When I think of players that are truly great, and I know I'm going to shock a lot of you, but I've put this on social media before. One of the best examples of a great player would be Jalen Hurts. To be a starting quarterback, lose your position in a championship game. I mean, get benched in a championship game. You were the one that got him undefeated and got him there. And just sit there and watch him get the glory. And then have the opportunity to leave and not leave. But sit there and go to practice and get no doubt your brain's beat in like every other football player. And I ain't talking about some high school football player. We're talking about monsters. 300 pound men crumbling, crushing. And yet he worked his way. And then what happens? He gets a shot. Now that's humility. You don't see a lot of it today. But we are seeing more and more of it. I mean, Burroughs, for example, for LSU, you do realize he was a backup quarterback. We have to learn humility. And humility is something that we see here coming up in our passage. Jesus' answers to the disciple was that. It was, in fact, humility. How did Jesus prove to be the greatest? How did Jesus become the best? What did He do? The truth is, is that He left the glories of heaven. He left the throne room of heaven, was born in a lowly manger in a town of Nazareth. And if you don't know anything about Nazareth, just remember what the disciple Nathaniel said and also what Pharisees said when they heard that the Messiah had come from Nazareth. You remember what they said? Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's like saying, I'm going to be president of the United States, but I live in Arab, Alabama. I hope you're not from Mayor at all. It's a sweet little town. But the truth is, is that nobody, when you think of great places, you don't think Arab. And when you think of places where the Messiah is going to come from, nobody thought Nazareth. Nobody did. In truth, it says clearly in Scripture that He did not come in beautiful form. He didn't have the form that when He walked down the street, all the heads turned and said, Wow! That's got to be the Messiah. No! He came in lowly form. He came to serve. That's what He did. And He says it right there on the cross, right here in our passage, that He is going to suffer and He is going to die. I am the Creator, the Sustainer of all things, but I'm about to suffer and die for you. I'm going to serve you. And I wish I could tell you that this passage right here, when Jesus tells them what it truly means to be great, is going to be the end of this discussion, but that's not it. Go all the way to the last night. The night where Christ is going to institute the Lord's Supper. The night that Judas is going to betray Him with a kiss in the garden. What are the disciples doing? Who's the greatest? Who's the best? Same argument. Same fussing and fighting. And there they're sitting there getting ready to eat. And apparently there was no servant there to wash their feet. And while they're arguing, debating over who's the greatest, and they're also refusing to wash one another's feet because nobody would stoop that low to wash their feet. I mean, I'm the greatest. You wash my feet. 
And what did the Savior do? He got up and took his outer garment off and put on a towel. And then he washed the feet of those men arguing over who's the greatest. We're talking about the one who spoke everything into existence. What examples does Jesus Christ give us about being great? That's the example. I was talking about it Wednesday nights. If you don't come on Wednesday nights, you truly are missing out on a blessing because we're just talking about basic theology, what it means to be in the church and what we believe. And we're talking about ordinances, baptisms, and Lord's Supper. And we drawn up the issue of foot washing. And I just simply asked the church, I said, do you know why we don't do foot washings today in churches? Number one, because it's nasty. But number two, humbling to have somebody wash your feet. And that's something you know most churches struggle with is humility. That's why I like that picture when it comes to foot washing because that foot right there is straight up nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, my Savior did that to men who were too prideful, too selfish, too self-centered to do it. And that's what he does for all of us. That is truly the greatest. To give an example of it, we see it here in a passage. Many people read this passage and they don't understand this part, but I want to explain it to you before we leave in verses 36 and 37. It says, Taking up a child, he set him before them and taking him in his arms. He said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. A lot of people struggle with this. And real quick before I get in there, let me kill this rabbit. I love the Bible. And the more you study it, the more I fall in love with it. People ask me all the time, How do you know the Bible's real? It's stories like this one. Do you all know that Mark's the only gospel that records that Jesus picked up a child? Matthew, Mark, and Luke address this statement that if you want to be great, you got to be a servant of all. But Mark is the only one that says this example that he picked up a child before them and embraced him in his arms. Do y'all know why that happened? Because odds are he is at Peter's house. Odds are we know that Peter had a mother in law because she was sick and Jesus raised her up. And if you got a mother-in-law, guess what you got? A wife. a wife. And guess what you also probably got? Kids. This Gospel of Mark is Peter's account. Mark was a disciple of Peter. And so the reason why Mark notes this, that the child was picked up and embraced in arms, is because the odds are that is either Peter's child or a nephew or a first cousin of some sort. Peter would remember the Savior embracing his loved one. For the other ones, it didn't mean that much. And so when people ask, how can you believe the Gospels? Man, because of things like that. Why did only one record it? Because the one that wrote it, it was special. You get an eyewitness account of what actually happened. But he embraces this child and Jesus took this child up to prove a point. The point that he is proving is this. See, in our culture today, children are the creme de la creme. They are everything. We, we set our lives aside for our children. But you need to realize that back in Jesus' time, it was not that way at all. Because they had lots of kids. And a sad reality, if you don't believe me, go out to this graveyard or any old graveyard and you'll see something very common. It's gravestones with very little years on them. Because children just didn't have that big of a life expectancy. And there was a uh, agricultural society and they would have a lot of children to try to help take care of the farms and take care of things. In fact, the children are almost viewed more as property, especially daughters, 
uh, because you were going to get a dowry for them. You were going to pay for raising them. And so children are just viewed different. And in fact, here, here's the key part of it. When he says, whoever receives a child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. That Aramaic word, Aramaic is the common language that they spoke during the time of Christ. The Aramaic word for child is servant. That's what it means. I mean, they, they didn't just call the kids kids. They called them servants because that's what they are. Servants. They served the father of the house. They served the good of the family. They were servants. And when Jesus picks up this child and he embraces this child in his arms and he says to them, you must be willing to serve the servant. You must be willing to embrace the care, love, and devote time and attention to a servant. And that is a wrap. Because who does that? Who even thinks about that? Jesus does. That's what He's trying to do. And that is why He takes His child and He embraces His child in His arms because He wants them to understand if you want to be great in this world, you've got to serve the servant. You've got to be lower than the servant. And not walk around with your chest puffed out, your head held high, demanding my way right away, and give me what is my due and my just desserts, but be willing to serve those and knowing you'll never get nothing in return. I, I, I've got it right here. In fact, I put your name in it, brother. <clears throat> How many times has your daughter paid you for gas to go to the salt? <laughs> I put your name, but it, it's my name too. It's everybody that got kids. Y'all are about to have one, Stephen. Y'all, y'all get ready. They're not gonna pay you for gas. They ain't gonna pay you for rent. They're not gonna pay you for the ball gloves or the cleats. And good lord, they gotta have cleats every year because their feet keep growing. <laughs> and you just keep chunking that money, chunking it. And do you know how much they paid me back for it? Not a dime. <laughs> I didn't get a penny back. But here's the truth, and I want y'all to hear this very well. I got a lot back by watching them play. I got a lot back working with them. Because y'all, it ain't really about being number one. It's about growing them as a human being. It's teaching them something. And what Jesus says here in that passage, when He picks that child up and puts it on his leg and embraces it, He says, if you really want to be great in this world, serve somebody that ain't going to give you nothing back. You ain't going to get any recognition for it. You ain't going to get a dime for it. But in serving somebody like that, you're going to grow. And you're going to have an experience that you have never experienced before. That's what he's saying because here's a reality check for us. How many of us has paid Jesus back for the service that he's done for us? Not a thing. I tell people all the time, Jesus did sit up in heaven and wring his hands. Oh my God, what am I going to do if Melanie don't love me and serve me? That's not what my Savior did. My Savior came and gave his life for a drunk that wasn't worth nothing knowing that he was never going to get in return what he paid for. But he did it because he loved it. And that's what we're called to do. I'll give you an example in the passage. Y'all know that Jesus clearly said that the man that was greatest born naturally of a woman was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the greatest. And do you know what Jesus said about that? That he not only was the greatest, and the reason why is because we saw in him this character. I mean, here he is. He is the talk of the town. They hadn't had a prophet in 500 some years. And now John the Baptist is on the scene. And everybody was going to John the Baptist to get baptized. Even the scribes and Pharisees are trying to figure out what to do with him. Because it was obvious he is a man of God. And he is the talk of the town. And all of a sudden Jesus comes up and we have a portion in Scripture where it says John the Baptist's disciples came up to John and said, John, 
that Jesus you baptized, He's baptizing more people now than you. What are we going to do about that guy? What are we going to do about that big church up the road that's getting so many more people than us? We're going to have to do something. Do you know what John the Baptist said? I ain't even worthy of tying his sandals. He said, I must decrease in order that he must increase. Y'all, that's humility. That is being humble and putting Christ and His kingdom and His glory above all other things. Because it wasn't about John's pride and it wasn't about John getting his just due and recognition. John wasn't perfect. John, he questioned the Messiah when his days were dark there in prison, Herod's prison. But John was humble. And humility is the key to all of it. We're guilty at times of even finding people that we think will make our lives even better. When at churches, we will go and we will try to find a doctor or a lawyer or some big CEO and say, man, what can this person do for the church? The truth is, is that we need to serve everybody. And in particular, serve those that can't do nothing and will never get nothing back. But that don't make sense in the world. It's not the way we think. But it is the way Jesus thought. And it is the way we see the early church. I'll give you an example of Philip. When Philip witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch. Y'all realize that the eunuch had gone to Jerusalem, but the scribes and the Pharisees would not teach him about Isaiah. They would not teach him anything because he was just a dirty servant and a Gentile. A eunuch was just a servant. And God took Philip out of the midst of a great revival and put him on a dirty road next to a chariot so he could witness to a servant. And do you know what? If you go to Jerusalem today, what you'll find in Jerusalem? You'll find Ethiopian Christian churches. You know how that happened? Because Philip was willing to serve a servant. He was willing to witness to that man and to lead him to Christ. You know, the truth is, we've We've really messed up churches at times. And the reason why we've messed it up is because we're always wondering who truly is going to be number one. When it comes to Show Creek, when it comes to churches in general, I want to ask you this simple question. What would happen if we actually sought out churches not based upon the church meeting our needs, but we actually sought out a church, a body, wanting to figure out how we can meet their needs? Do y'all realize how that would change everything? But the vast majority of the Christian world, when they seek out a church, what's the number one thing on their mind? What are you going to do for me? How are you going to serve me? What would happen if we actually had a servant's mind and said, how can I help you? Instead of looking at a church and saying, man, they're not doing that right there, that part right there. I wish they'd change that. So I'm going to go to the next church. What if we actually said, I'll be the one to try to fix that? That would change it. But see how our world and our way of thinking has nothing to do with the way of Christ and His way of thinking. Christ is always flipping things upside down. This world screams and wants to know who is number one. And I want you to understand this. Jesus at no point in time said it was wrong to strive to be great. You know, you don't see this in that passage at all. He doesn't say don't strive to be great. He doesn't even say don't try to be number one. There's nothing wrong with healthy competition. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be great. But what Jesus does tell us in this passage is how to be great. If you really want to be great, be humble and serve a servant. That is what being great truly is. And if we have that kind of mentality, then you wouldn't see what you see in churches where you have to just beg people to serve on a committee or on a media ministry or in worship or in Sunday school people just have a natural desire to serve or at the thrift store I close with this example I'm going to have a picture put up 
on the screen. Will you go to the next slide, brother, for me? Anybody know who that woman is? And y'all ain't even Catholic. Do y'all know she was not a great inventor? She was not a CEO. She did not die with millions or billions in her bank account. She did not have a fancy home. She didn't. She was not a sports star. She didn't have her name in Broadway lights. You know what she did? She just served. She literally gave her life to serve those that could never, ever give her anything in return. That's what she did. The quote there says, We ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. She just wanted to serve. And many of us don't serve because we think it ain't really going to make that big of a difference. The truth is it will. It will change you. And how much less would a church be if the disciples of Christ decided that they didn't need to serve? You all know God made everything. He made the birds of the air. I like birds. I love looking at eagles and they just because I'm an awful. I think they're beautiful. They really are. I have one in my office. Crows are big, strong birds. Red tail hawks, man, I love the red tail. I've forgotten how many red tail hawks are in North Alabama until I moved back. Buzzards are big birds. But you know what? I've never seen a hawk or an eagle buzzard or crow do. I've never seen them sing a song. Never heard them. Sometimes it is the least and the smallest of things in this world that sings praises unto the Lord all day long. They make the most beautiful music and give us the most joy. If you want to be great, be humble. And learn humility and learn to serve the servant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to study your word this morning, to grow in our knowledge and understanding of it. I just simply ask that you now do what only you can do, and that is to change our hearts. Father, your word is given to the church for a reason. It's to point us to Christ, but it's also to grow and mature us. And this message this morning, Father, was for your church that you desire for us to do all things as unto you. To do things and to do it well. Father, you desire for us to be great. But to be great in the way that you desire for us to be great. Not to be just great in the eyes of a world but to be great in the eyes of a servant. To be great in the eyes of the servant, Jesus Christ, who gave up everything to serve those who could never pay back what He gave them. Father, may we now live a life like Christ that we're willing to serve knowing that we may never get anything in return. No recognition. No prize. But the truth is, is that when I get to heaven, there will be a prize given. It'll be a crown. And then I get to take that crown and lay it at the feet of Christ who gave it all for me. Father, there's one here today that doesn't know Christ and the price that He's paid on the cross of Calvary. May you awaken him to that truth as we sang so beautifully about. Father, for those that have given their lives to Christ, I ask now that you would help them overcome this world and the thoughts of this world of what it truly means to be great and number one. To die to pride and to selfishness, but to grow in humility. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. This is
is our time of invitation. If you'd like to come and pray, come and pray. If you'd like to come talk to me or to join the church or to just let the church know about a decision you've made to follow Christ, now is the time to do so. So let's stand for him with invitation.
it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.